Damn, if I didn't think, I love season one so much. Um, I think I will, I worship at the altar of Justin Spitzer. I love everything he does. He's but unreal. I, but I think season two was better than season one. Who knew? Um, I got through this season in like, like literally a day and a half. It was just, it's just so, probably not even that long. Um, yeah. Um, and you have some amazing, I just wrote down some of your lines. Uh, it's hard to <laughs> it's hard to respect someone who's been such a whiny little bitch. Um, I've done a lot of pointless <laughs> couples therapy. I know how to fake an open mind. Um, but I think <laughs> my favorite one is after all we've been through today, we'll be like rubbing <laughs> rubbing one out on a rainbow. I don't know how isn't that beautiful? How beautiful. Um, I believe that was an alt. I think there were several that were <laughs> Even for uh, our show, which manages to get past standards and practices pretty consistently, oh. still couldn't cut it. Um, what I have to say to every beautiful thing you just said, and thank you, sure. is um, that, what did I start to say that I've already forgotten? Um, he writes, he's such a good writer, and mm. he writes, as you noted, in specifics that are fantastic and character driven and delightful he writes episodically in a way that's right. pointed with a with a um a dial in that's strong on on per episode mm -hmm. and then to speak to your finishing the season in a day and a half it's really interesting that it's network television because he's really writing binge worthy shows he's writing shows that you can sit yeah. down and inhale like a you know 13 course meal that start at a place and end at a place and i definitely felt like season two delivered that way i thought i thought season one did as well but we you know the great thing about the second season is that you don't have to spend all this expository time yeah both yeah. as a writer or a performer you know figuring out oh look my character really did it that like mm -hmm. you know all of the, that crap and and you can just start to tell stories and you know the audience will give you a lot more um you know rope to hang yourself with <laughs> well it's it's funny that because i was watching it and my husband was just like happened to be in the room and he he's a big superstore fan and uh oh no you froze okay uh -huh. there you are your husband was in the room my husband was in the room and he i thought he watched season one with me last year and apparently not but like halfway through the season he was like he was like oh season one this this great and i was like yeah did you not watch season one and he was like no i just jumped into season two and uh oh, that's good he said it what he knew you could tell what the relationships were very quickly and um he got mad at me because i finished the season without him like he came literally came in running holding his ears he's like i don't want to know i don't want to know so oh uh, that's amazing yeah. um okay there's so much really great stuff this year but i guess i want to ask do you think Catherine's meltdowns because of the stakes of <laughs> season two which she which she positions for herself um, did you sort of want to up the ante on those? Because I think they're even bigger and greater. Like episode one, I was like, all right, we're starting. She's flipping out and throwing shit and screaming. And yeah. I think it's such a perfect, because she is such a fast talking, um, you know, she's a true sort of ADD CEO. She's got mm -hmm. a million things going on. I mean, I think CEOs are, I think they have just like, they're, they're really good at executive functioning. We call it that, but they also have ADD. They're able to like top and flop around really yeah. fast. Um, and they don't want to stay or hang around on anything too long. So I think, so that component of her has always been there driving the content, driving the storyline, driving the pain narrative, whatever the thing is that's happening, mm -hmm. um, moving forward, absolutely compartmentalizing all things emotional probably has been for 20 years you know what i mean right. so mm -hmm. so that everything is just like i don't have time i don't have time to melt down i also think she believes that leadership is um comprised of 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 setting a positive tone and blasting ahead mm -hmm. and believing in the future and i believe that she believes that but i think that's why those meltdowns are so um they're they're so sort of strategic they're not a regular part of her day, but they're, yeah. they probably happen tectonically, 
you know, three times a year, um, which again, uh, great leaders. And, and of course, comedically, they're delightful because she's keeping such a lid. It really is like a, a Justin writes, you know, 40 pages for 20 minutes. It's, it's a fat, it's fast it's dialogue. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, which is really, really fun and really, really challenging. Mm -hmm. Um, and and I think also works for sort of her for the intellect of the characters and the sort of pace of the world that they're operating in. I think the sense of urgency about everything in the corporate world, um, so that the explosions are like these necessary sort of pressure, pre like a pressure cooker exploding. You know. Yeah, it's um, not. It's not extraneous. It's it's all character driven. Like it's it's such yeah. a beautiful build up to where it's like the audience is like well I would freak the fuck out too because it's just so yeah. yeah and again I think what's delightful is and it just happens to be one of my favorite moves in the show is that we have there's such arrogant people in some respects <laughs> they're so superior they're so rich they really are you know at times they believe themselves to be above impunity and the, above the law um, but they're in this glass conference room where they're, we're so frequently in all those group scenes, mm -hmm. disdainful of everyone who is not the top shelf of the C-suite. You know, we're, we always throw shade kind of as a community together. But then we have these explosions that are so public because we think we're acting as though they're private because they're behind glass. But they, I feel like they artfully cut away so well to everyone in the, you know, that's in the in the in the work pool that's looking at these like massive massive meltdowns that you know I feel like you're you're always kind of witnessing the worst of your parents divorce yeah. you know when you're watching yeah. <laughs> it actually <I> rewatched <laughs> I re I rewatched the first the, in episode one Catherine has a meltdown and it, it was it was just happened to be after I watched you know the succession after you what after I watched oh, oh yeah yeah succession. yeah and my favorite thing about the succession finale, I was like, it, I would love to if they had a shot of the boardroom seeing the children fighting. And I was like, it's literally sort of the same. Like, I would love to see, uh, we do see it in American Auto of everyone else seeing the freakouts behind glass. And I was like, that's brilliant. I, I want to see the cast. The highest, so, yeah, the highest that. praise, that's such a good, that's such a good insult. The highest praise that I don't remember who gave it, but it's like what we always hope would take on is like funny succession. I mean, even though we're not really, <laughs> dealing with a family succession. I do think that there aren't that many shows that are dealing with um, this kind of window into the very strange uh, way in which corp our, relate our, our American cultural relationship with corporate America mm -hmm. has changed. And our kind of um, the, the ways in which that corporate culture reflects back our value system. What I love about our show, and I think this is true in a, a sense of of succession as well um is that pain has become a character in the narrative you know like we, we actually care theoretically about what happens to the company um which is the same thing with you know waystar in some respects okay. um, <laughs> except, <laughs> except hopefully you're rooting a little bit more for us i don't know <laughs> um, i want to talk about the episode titled the letter um, yeah because wow that is that's such a great episode and it's it's the um I love how the show I mean Justin does this on a lot of his writing where he takes mm -hmm. he takes a very you know public uh I'll say volatile subject people have very strong opinions mm -hmm. and he he addresses them and pivots them in a way with comedy that honors everybody's perspective that as a viewer, you're like, oh, this is right, this is right, this is right. Um, but I just wanted to know what it was like to read that episode just because of, you know, the horrible shitty circumstances that this country is going through and, you know. Yeah. Yeah, just be, it's um, episode of television, yeah. We were really thirsty for it. You know, the, the precursor to this wasn't, I mean, obviously the show, I think the show, I really do, I'm not just saying this because I'm on it, I just think there's a contemporary quality to the show mm -hmm. that it's reflecting the shit show complication of of um American culture right now that mm -hmm. we are we're asking more of our workplaces we're asking for all all of us with all of our diverse values are asking for all of those values to constantly be represented I mean this morning there you know Chick-fil-A is in deep 
deep shit with, you know, the, the woke people like woke messaging. So it's, it's ev everywhere you turn. I feel like it's an, it's just a new uncharted territory that we're in. And so mm -hmm. Justin's asking that of pain motors. He's asking the company to reflect back the complex, you know, the, 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 the people, I guess what we're, we're, we're struggling with the relationship between the responsibilities inherent in a workplace and the bottom line and the shareholders. And frankly, mm -hmm. like just the, the crass, disgusting late stage capitalist mm -hmm. values of making as much money as possible in spite of humans. And so sort of the human beings caught in the middle on that. So the precursor to this was the episode, I think all of the episodes, but really last season was an episode called Commercial, which was about making a politically correct commercial, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a runaway train of trying to make everybody happy, but still trying to make enough money, but trying, yeah. you know, so he does this incredibly well, as you've noted. And the letter, um, the, he said early on, he was like, you know, we're going to try to, we're going to try to do that again. Look, the, the first episode was about racism and AI technology and self-driving yeah. cars. So we knew what we were getting into as a as a cast. I mean, we knew that it was like not going to be um, you know, Friday night a family half hour. It's it's mm -hmm. a show that's talking about things that are real and contemporary and somewhat um uncomfortable and there and yeah. and finding the comedy therein, right? Mm -hmm. And workplaces are great for that because you can you can you can kind of get into the the weeds on these uncomfortable topics and have lots of people take positions that we can then laugh at. So the letter is about, um, you know, the, the big A abortion um, uh, policy that the, that the company takes on, mostly regarding how we care for employees um, who are seeking out-of-state abortions, mm -hmm. which is a, you know, a struggle. Really, though, the, the episode is about generational attitudes and the ways in which we are uh, demanding certain ethical positions from our workplaces, even though our workplaces consist of diverse human beings. So yeah. it's just super complicated. And we as a cast were super excited to do it. Yeah. If anything, NBC was understandably like, as soon as the word abortion gets thrown in there, you know, it's funny because it was before the midterm election. So it was, no one knew how this was all going to shape down. I think, I think more and more and more, it's part of the conversation in American culture because people are, people are, you know, yeah. it has less of the taboo and more of the just kind of commonplace political landscape that, you know, conversation, um, if that makes any sense. But uh, Justin asked us to please, he begged NBC, basically. He was like, let me do this. Trust me. I don't know if I'm spilling company secrets. Um, you know, I feel like this is going to be our episode, like the commercial episode. Hopefully it's talking about something. Hopefully it makes people laugh. Hopefully they see themselves. Hopefully they see their, you know, their coworker and they can find some common ground and in the comedy around how incredibly thorny and complicated these situations become incredibly quickly. Yeah. And so NBC um, uh, relented and let us do a read of it and, he was he was basically just like let's read it let's hear it out loud and it was a fantastic episode it was incredibly well written we all we all we were excited we like we like episodes like that we yeah. like episodes that feel like they're that's why we signed on to do the show you know i mean it's not not just because i don't mean to be, we're like i'm not like some you know po political artist but <laughs> the show is intelligently debating american culture it's de it's debating yeah. American ethics in the American workplace. It's a, it's deliberately set in a classic American manufacturing industry um, with an old boy's history with a new female CEO. And it's asking questions about what our relationship to workplaces are now. It's it's a half hour workplace comedy, yes. But I think that the the setting, the corporate setting is really key to the comedy, you know? Yeah, sort of with like, taking a traditional American setting, hurting these like thorny issues with, you know, dozens of people with different perspectives. I mean, that's like, not to use a cheesy phrase, but that's like sort of comedy gold. It's just sort of like, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, for, yeah. I, I hope so. And obviously, every time you make the episode, you think, oh, well, I hope that that does that. I mean, you don't, 
I, what I love about Justin, he's not strident about it. He doesn't have a message, you know, it's just where he finds mm -hmm. comedy. He's very natural that way. I mean, it's obviously like in the tradition of Norman Lear, like it has this, yeah. he just has an ear for the ways in which people get caught in the crossfire with one another. Um, yeah. And, and he writes to characters that hold those, hold those positions and he finds it funny. You know, that's, that's kind of the best scenario. Mm hmm yeah, very incredibly character driven writing. Um, that's what that's agreed. What, um, which which oh, yeah. which is meaningful to me, not to be all feminist about it, but you know, coming up from like I'm a I'm a character actress. I'm mm -hmm. I'm I'm a I'm a com comedian who came out of the nineties tradition. I love I love playing a character. And so sometimes those Sometimes workplace comedies can feel very rat a tat, smart, mm -hmm. smart, smart. And this somehow manages to be the combination between intellectual and character driven. Yeah. In my humble opinion. And as you can see, I'm very humble. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, like, you know, thinking of um, seeing the care, I always think like a really good character driven, um, especially a workplace comedy, is if I want to know where the characters go after they leave work, I feel like that means. Um, it, it's steeped in character. And the other really great mm. that I love is when everyone comes over to Catherine's house. And I, I know. like, like taking them out, like just taking them out of the office and putting them in a completely different environment makes them uncomfortable, um, which is which is also comedy gold. It, it's great. Um, you have this line, it's later towards the episode before they really start having a good time where Catherine says, I know how to be alone. And I just thought that dropping that line in there, it's it's very sad, but also, mm -hmm. um, I I don't know that sort of hit me a little bit because I was just like, oh god, it just be, made me think of how maybe Catherine, you know, she's alone in you know being a female CEO in this industry in her marriage in this insanely huge house, like literally alone, huge, huge, yeah. Um, that, that she never gets to spend time in. No, yeah. Like, I imagine her walking through her house being like, oh, I didn't even know this room was here. <laughs> Just because she doesn't get a chance to do it. Um, can you talk to me about how that episode really, like, shook up the really great chemistry that you folks already have? I was really nervous about it. So I'm really? I'm thrilled that oh, you wow. like it. Ye yeah, because of exactly that. I mean, exactly what you spoke to. I think that the character lives unconsciously a lot. You know, I think, I think workaholics at that level are, I mean, she's had to, in order to achieve what was expected of her, basically shut off the questioning part of her brain, which is what makes her arrogant and funny a lot of the time. But I mean, it's a very sweet and compassionate um, take that you've given her. I mean, I do think she just, you're right. Like I, I, I what is it? It's like, Less than ten percent of of Fortune five hundred female CEOs are are women. I mean, it's it's mm. still it's still a really pathetically short number, small number. Mm -hmm. And you know, this woman's fifty five, and and yes, there is one notable Mary Barra is a, a very notable CEO, um, but there it's a very dude driven industry. It's you know, mm -hmm. so she's had to kind of like blinder herself in this way, make her calls on you know we. She did go to Wharton. She does have an MBA. Justin has always maintained that she's deeply intelligent. She mm -hmm. just doesn't care about the industry that she's working in. She doesn't believe she needs to know about cars. She doesn't believe, she just has to, you know, it's like this certain manner of like, I just have to manage people yeah. and I have to manage the ship and I have to sell the product. And I don't, you know, if this is an emotional, there's no feelings. It's like a whole, there's actually a great little scene lit in, in, in the letter episode when Sadie and she are in, um, HR together when they have to go watch the HR film mm -hmm. together and she he wrote this really nice little sort of mini monologue about like how the rules got all changed around so she was like we weren't uh -huh. allowed to have any feelings it was like a you know deficit anyway so when when the line came up about I know how to be alone it's not self-pitying it's a mm -hmm. fact for her it's a um, it's pragmatic it's just I have to kind of if I took time to sit around and boo-hoo about all of this, I would be very, very sad, you know? Um, yeah. And I, 
and I would also realize what a horrific empty life I'm leading. Um, so it was really sweet because I do think that sort of nature of workplace comedies are this kind of found family. Yeah. And especially among the female cast, I am a connector as a human being. And so I, mm -hmm. I, I really do enjoy, I love the little relationship she has with Dory. I love the little relationship she has with Sadie. I mean, they're complicated and they're like siblings or, or um, confidants at moments, but there is this like, interesting in spite of their status in spite of their class differences all of those things in in the office they're they have each other's backs you know and i love that last little scene where they're lying in bed together oh my god there was a that made me laugh so much i was like oh they're all in this gigantic house and they're all in like <laughs> <laughs> that made me because that made they're me all scared yeah <laughs> I love it. This house is insane. They have like, you know, again, I love that. I love that. You know, they finally go down to the, the wine room and these are like th thousands and thousands of dollars worth of booze that you're never going to drink because you're never home. Yeah, that's What's not, the point? That's not Just a amassing wine it for no reason. That's a, that's a wine house. Like that's a, <laughs> that's a, it's not a wine cellar, a wine house. It's so big. I was like, oh. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's an, un inconceivable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Um, but I'm glad you liked the episode. I really am. Oh, it was easily the letter and that one are my two favorite episodes of the season. It's 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 and and oh my god, the finale is so good too because it's so it's like a race against time to see if everyone's gonna keep their job. That's awesome. That's so interesting. Um I do um I guess I have time for one more question. Um just because <laughs> well, first I do want to say that I love how the show uh, you know, as she is arrogant. She has a lot of money. Somebody that you like shouldn't root for. I love how basically the season truly makes no. her an underdog. And it's sort of like when she, when you start screaming like, "I'm a good CEO!" at the end, I, like, that's a <laughs> great moment. And it sort of made me think, and I was just like, yeah. the weird way my brain is like, I don't know, going against that. I don't know. It's just so. It's such like a mind. Yeah. Yeah. Because it is. It's the C-suite. It's disgusting. Yeah. And that's where the making making the show, uh, making pain um, a character in a way, making them have to contend with the, the sort of tornado of this corporate beast that really will swallow them up and shit them out. Just, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, sorry. Just as much as like, you know, as just as much as another sort of enemy could kind of, I think, made them more empathic this year. I mean, mm. they were, look, Justin was very deliberate. <laughs> it is really hard to make incredibly rich assholes likable. That's a challenge. But but by virtue of the fact that we we sort of see them contend with every, like this little, you know, window into every nightmarish American scenario and, and there's plenty more to come, you know, politics and whatever else um, and have them sort of be buffeted by the, by the whims of whatever's happening socially, mm -hmm. whatever's happening politically, what's happening with the stock price, what's happening with the board, what's happening with the consumer, what's happening, you know, there's no real control. Like these are the people that are supposed to be running everything. And they're, yeah. they're kind of, um, they're kind of at the mercy of the wind, you know, and, and I thought by making, so season one, obviously here comes this, you know, new boss It's basically like, is, can, can I keep my new job under new leadership? It's sort of the premise. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think by making it, by putting her, having her put her, Catherine put herself on the line at the top of season two on behalf of her team, you know, semi-loyal team, you mm -hmm. know, um, sets it up as the sudden us against them as opposed to a dogfight internally yeah. and i thought that that was like a really i thought that was a really savvy move and it also just let me shine i i i am i can i can be a natural leader but i'm also a connector i'm also i come from ensemble improv i worked in mm -hmm. the theater you know i literally came saturday night live the groundlings like everything i do is about working with other people in partnership so yeah. um that that made it easier for me as a performer, frankly, mm -hmm. to lean into um, kind of all of us against something together. Yeah, I, I love that, that it is sort of like this, 
uh, unspoken unity against every single thing that's outside of that room. <laughs> they have to like beat it. Yeah, up. and that we kept it when we discussed it. Like at first, it was this kind of conversation of you know, oh, uh, you saw, it's sort of Catherine putting her neck on the line. But I was like, that's all true. And Justin and I talked about it at the beginning. Was like, but she would remind everybody at least once an episode. <laughs> <laughs> that she had sacrificed something for them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which we had fun. Lest we forget. He was like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. I, uh, you are here because of my enormous because of sacrifice. Me. Of course. Yeah. Uh, I guess one last question before I let you go is, I want to know if you on a gas tire would drive a Pika. You know, it was the sweetest, okay, again, like, you've got me in bittersweet mode but um yes but the answer is I definitely would because I am not from a car world at all I grew up in yeah. I grew up in a city I lived in and then I lived in New York City for 25 years so when you have when you're when you grow up in a city your relationship to car culture is like mm -hmm. will it get sideswiped will they steal my radio like there's just like a, it's just like a general that was a very 90s reference but you know what yeah, I mean I don't. um yeah <laughs> um the old what was that thing that we used to put on the steering wheel um oh the club anyway yeah 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 the club <laughs> um uh, how many clubs are sitting in landfills as we speak mm -hmm. but um anyway i would say so it was really interesting like in that i love the season finale you know every all all hope is lost and Catherine's kind of given in and she, she's done this one thing which is to help develop this terrible ten thousand dollar car and and again this is back to to, to Dory, to X, Mayo, getting in the car and driving. And, and she, it's such a revelation. She's like, you know, I think it's really cool that this mm -hmm. is a $10,000 car. It was cut, unfortunately, for time. But when we first start driving the car, I was like, it'll, we just go out for a test drive together. And um, Michael Benjamin Cyrus is driving. <laughs> We're like, hey, it drives pretty good. And then there was this huge bump like that. And I say, what was that? And he goes, a pine cone. <laughs> it's like literally no shock absorbers in the car. So we ran out. It's one of my favorite jokes. But it, was, it, it was cut. But anyway, this piece of tin, you know. And then Dory says, I think it's really cool. This is going to be a lot of people's first car. Mm -hmm. And you really do remember your first car. It's yeah. like a, it's like a super, you might save up for it. You have your, you know, first crappy fast food job, your babysitting money or whatever. So you can mm. put down money for your, for your, for your, it's a really big first purchase in a person's life. And it was such a shrewd observation because it's, it becomes an emotional connection to the vehicle and maybe to, to the company at large. And so the answer is I probably would drive a Pika um, or I would think about buying a Pika for my, mm -hmm. my college age child, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. I mean, probably the safety ratings are, are terrible. So maybe, maybe I would have to give it some special thought, but, um, mm -hmm. that said, I, I think there's something really funny about the fact that it, it is this, it is oddly this like cornerstone experience for people, you know? Yeah. Maybe. Would you drive a Pika, Joey? Um, you know, the thing was my first car that you, you're totally right. Like the, makes you think of your first car. And I remember, um, the first car I got my brother, my older brother, who was a year older than me, he went through used cars. Like it was his job. He kept crashing them. <laughs> and I remember telling my dad when it was my turn to get a car, I was like, listen, he's wrecked a lot of cars. You just need to give me something and it'll be fine. And he bought me a car it was small like the pika it was an ugly color blue like the pika um but yep. i love that car yep. so um and i do remember there what was, was it it was like a blue chevy something but it, it had like the ugly fiesta i think that's what it was it was like it was so what a ford fiesta it was so uh small but i'm a small person i'm a short person so it was it was fine but i loved that car and i was really sad when it finally uh died but the yeah the I, I had a Datsun V210 yeah. which is exactly like the Pika it's tiny oh. it's a tin can you know hand crank windows I mean oh, yeah. terrifying I can't I, I we bought it from our neighbor for a dollar for to transfer the title um oh, and I had to pay my parents I think I paid my parents a hundred for it because they mm -hmm. were like you've got to pay for your first car yeah. um and we would drive to 7-Eleven. We could go off campus for lunch, I remember, because mm -hmm. we were seniors. And we would yeah. go to 7-Eleven and we would smoke in that car. And I have the happiest memories in it. <laughs>
yeah, there's something about you just doing this. I was like, people don't do this anymore. I'm trying to roll the- <laughs> Come on, guys, get Come in. On. Like, what does this mean <laughs> what? anymore? Hold what? on. Huh? Um, <laughs> no, but they're, like, there's even a line where they're, they're you know, reacting to the response. We're like, I just need to get to point A to point B. That's the, that is the thing where I, I distinctly remember telling my dad. I was like, I don't need anything fancy. Get me to point A to point B. So I would have a Pika if I... Yeah. So fun fact, Justin's dad says that. Really? <laughs> That's a just Justin's dad is not a car guy. And he always says, I just need to get from point A to point B. That's all I want. So that's Justin took that inspiration for someone who's like, what's the big deal? From mm-hmm. his dad. Oh, I love that. Okay. Mm-hmm. There needs to be a special American Auto NBC tie-in. <laughs> just make just make a couple hundred real Picas and see how it goes. Well, that was like my big, you know, season three. I would, what I would really love is to go with a Pika to the Detroit Auto Show. That's like my my dream. I all I all I want to do is like weird marketing things and go and stand there as Catherine Hastings and like take a Q and A. That's like, Ron Burgundy style. <laughs> but that would be, you know, like like your bread and butter, something you would totally like to do, improv in character. I would love it. And they would, they would, they would never want to like bother me to do it. I'd be like, are you kidding? That's like, and, and Ty White, who plays Jack is from Mm -hmm. Detroit and has like a ton of family. He's like, we we have to go like, yeah. So anyway, it would be fun. I love it. Uh, Well, thank you so much for your time. I I just think it's so, it's so biting and so quick and it makes me automatically want to go back and watch it again. It's insanely watchable. Um, I cannot thank you enough for saying that, you know, it's very hard in this world to get any attention on, on, uh, any show anywhere. And the mm -hmm. fact that this is a network show on top of that, it's, it's been an interesting challenge, but I think it is what you just said. is so, it just is music to my ears because that's why we're doing it, you know? And, and, um, and I think, I think if we can find the eyeballs, hopefully, hopefully people will like it yeah yeah totally all right well um hope you have a good rest of your day uh good luck to you you too yeah enjoy your strike oh, yeah. oh. all right <laughs> <laughs> bye <laughs>